and I'm 38 years old. You're not supposed to be fighting at this high of a level at 38 years old. The news is just exploding over the Conor McGregor, Michael Chandler fight. What's going on there? Conor McGregor, yes, of course I want to fight him, but I do not need Conor McGregor for my legacy. The Chandler McGregor fight will happen eventually, it's just not now. Where does faith fall into the picture for you? It's been revealed to me so many times over my entire life in all these different seasons, how God has had me in the palm of his hand. And even in the seasons where I feel like everything's over, right? When I lost three fights in a row, that's where you start to question things, but then you look back and you say, man, I needed that. Talk a little bit about what your regimen is like to have your body in top physical condition. What we have been starting to work together, the Hypermax Oxygen, the Cold Plunge, the Pimp Mat, and the Red Light. This was the best I have ever felt in my entire life. At 38 years old. What can the fans expect next out of Michael Chandler? We got a date set now. The next step. Today's guest, Michael Chandler, is a three-time Bellator lightweight champion and one of the most electrifying fighters to ever fight in the Ultimate Fighting Championship. You're really going to get to know him during this podcast. He's relevant in the news right now, trying to get this Conor McGregor fight to really happen. And he talks about his road to the championship and how it's actually not going through Conor McGregor anymore. He's going to talk about what he thinks about Conor McGregor, when and if that fight's going to happen, and how he's going to get to his next UFC title. What's really amazing about this podcast is you're really going to get to know who Michael Chandler is. You're going to get to know the family man, the father, the D1 walk-on championship wrestler. You're going to really get insight into the fabric of who this gentleman is. I have so much respect for him after this podcast. It's going to be one of the most enjoyable podcasts for you guys to watch. Even if you are not a fight fan, there's so much to unpack here about the man, Michael Chandler. Listen and enjoy, guys. Hey guys, welcome back to the Ultimate Human Podcast. I'm your host, human biologist, Gary Brecka, where we go down the road of everything anti-aging, biohacking, longevity, and everything in between. And today's guest is, unless you've been in a coma, and maybe even if you have been in a coma, you know my next guest because he is all over the news right now. It is the biggest thing going on in fight sports. We're out in Las Vegas with my good friend, Michael Chandler. Welcome Gary. to the podcast, brother. Thank you. I'm super pumped Thank to have you on. Me um, as well. This is awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it, you and I have had a, a, a little bit of a journey together, um, and we're going to talk about that on the recovery side and everything else. Um, but we scheduled this podcast, and I came out for the the uh, you know the UFC 306, uh, you know, at the Sphere. I'm all excited to go to the Sphere, and dude, the news is just exploding mm -hmm. over. The Conor McGregor, Michael Chandler fight. I think that Dana first leaked it out, you know, by accident yeah. that the fight was off. Um, so tell me, man, in your own words, like what, what's going on there? What's up with you? And so, yeah. So I've, I've known for about four weeks that we were going to make, make a pivot. And I wasn't sure when they, when it was actually going to get announced. I was hoping mm -hmm. it was going to get announced this. Oh, so you knew it was off for a while. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've known. So the fight was never off unless I wanted to, to, make it be off mm -hmm. necessarily or just wait for connor and i was just at some point you know i don't want to ever look back and say i wasted too much time i gave it the right. old college try i gave it a good enough try me and connor got us a contract signed to fight in june 29th and then he pulls out and then they gave me the opportunity and said hey well there's charles Oliveira is waiting in their wings he needs a fight um that's a big fight. It's a rematch. Huge um, fight for you. Fight. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's one of those, you know, in mixed martial arts, you want, obviously you want the biggest fights possible and you want the right fights at the right time. This is the right time to fight Charles Oliveira. It'll be a number one contender fight. And then I go from being a guy who sat out a little bit waiting for the Connor thing, which I had the huge promotion of the ultimate fighter and had a lot of growth over the last year. Didn't take any damage. It, it was all really good. But then now coming into this fight and waiting for Connor. And I'm going to be able to come back, beat Charles Oliveira, and then become the number one contender, get the opportunity to fight for the title if I want next. Right. Or if Connor can finally get his house in order, string together a training camp, <laughs> proves to everybody that he's going to come back and, and is serious about making the greatest comeback in combat sports mm -hmm. history, then we can finish the Chandler versus Connor McGregor fight that it was supposed to happen. I believe that fight will happen at some point. And his road back to the UFC goes straight through Nashville, Tennessee to fight me. That's yeah. that's it. He's he. 
he can't just come back and pick and choose who he wants to fight. So right. I'm going to take a little detour, go continue to chase my number one goal, which has always been my number one goal to become the number one guy in the world and fight for a world title, win the world title. Right. And uh, I got to beat Charles Oliveira first to do that and then go beat Islam or Connor. And the thing about this Connor fight is that, you know, Connor's not on the pathway to becoming a world champion. I mean, he's, yeah. he's it, it's probably the fight that the media most wants to see, that the fans most want to see. I mean, it, it arguably the biggest, you know, fight in, 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 in UFC history. But is that really a fight for Michael Chandler? I mean, yeah. is this really something for your career or? Yeah, I mean, obviously I knew, I knew that going into it. When Hunter Campbell called me to do the Ultimate Fighter in January of 2023, which I had to leave in February, come here to Vegas and film it. Mm -hmm. um, I knew that. It's like, hey, everyone's talking about this fight. This is a fight that makes sense. He wants to do the, do the Ultimate Fighter. Would you like to do the Ultimate Fighter? The answer is yes, because of the Ultimate Fighter, the history of it, the platform of it, 12 hours, 12 weeks on ESPN and everything that came with it, it was a huge opportunity. Plus, the biggest combat, store, biggest combat star on the planet is Conor McGregor. Yes, right. of course I want to fight him. I knew it wasn't a fight that got me toward the title athletically, mm -hmm. um, but or career advancement career wise advancement, but yeah. it, but it kind of is too, because yes, this is a sport, but it also depends a lot on how big your name is, how, how mm -hmm. much weight is behind your name, a win over Conor McGregor with that many eyeballs, you know, the proof is in the pudding. It puts you more towards, you know, being, uh, in the position to fight for the title. So I understand, understood the, the fight, the fighting side of it, didn't really check that box to get me toward the title, but it did from a promotional standpoint. Yeah. And ultimately, I'm here to make the biggest impact I possibly can. So the more people who know my name, the more people who see me, the more people who hear my voice, um, that's how I make the greatest amount of impact. So that's yeah. the way I kind of weighed the pros and cons of it all. But me and Connor will fight eventually. I just not next. Not next. <laughs> not next. You know, um, I, I remember the you know the first time that the uh, you know the fight started getting on wobbly legs. Um, when, when did you, how did you first, I mean, I think there was a presser that was get, that got canceled yeah. and, you know, you, I guess you could think, hey, they, they can cancel a presser and the fight's still on. Mm -hmm. But I remember that a presser got cancer, canceled overseas and then the rumors started swirling and there's a whole, I mean, I, I actually went down deep down the rabbit hole and all the MMA sites before, even before jumping on the podcast and there's all kinds of stuff out there about Connor, um, you know, good and bad about, you know, why this fight has been delayed so many times i mean everything from his injuries to partying to he had a big financial score um to you know is he even going to get back in the ring again um and they all seem to have some measure of credibility yep um what's your take on on this yo-yo position i'm not calling him yo-yo yeah. the, the, the yo-yo up and down Connor, i did not call you no yo -yo, the brother. up and down nature of it <laughs> similar to a yo-yo yes yeah um man i it's it's always interesting, right? Because you can read the headlines and you can look at it all, and you can you can take this big pie chart that is who Conor McGregor is, and say, well, because of these definitely reasons, definitely a dynamic character. Yeah, for he's sure. a dynamic character, and like you said, all of those things have been talked about, whether they're true, not overblown, underblown, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, but I always like to say, yes, me and Conor live two completely different lifestyles, and we mm -hmm. are two different types of people. But I've also never walked a mile in his shoes. Uh, give me that kind of fame, that kind of fortune, that kind of notoriety. And let's see what kind of guy I am, right? I think I have a sneaky suspicion I'd be very similar to the guy I am currently right now. Right. Um, but I also cannot judge a man. When it comes to his propensity and willingness to come back and fight, I think it's I think it's still there. And that's why I was willing to bet on that horse mm. throughout this process. I think it is still there. Not necessarily because I believe Conor McGregor believes he's going to win a world title or he's still who the Conor from 2021 or 2020 and 2018 when he had he became the double champ and mm -hmm. all that. I don't think he believes he is that guy anymore, but I do believe that he needs the sport of mixed martial arts like he needs oxygen. Yeah, I believe he needs to continue to fill a void inside of him that only one thing can ever, ever give him. The money won't give it to him. The fame won't give it to him. He needs to step inside of an octagon and stand in the middle and do this and feel like a god. He needs that. That's what he wants. That is his breath. Mm. That is his oxygen. Um, so I've always bet on that spirit of the man more than I actually bet on the man of his, uh, himself. Mm -hmm. um, currently, I have been proven wrong, obviously, but I do believe <laughs> at some point he's going to come back. And that's why it was so important for me to attach my name to that contract. And it's undeniable at this point. If he comes yeah. back, he's got to fight me. So that's what I believe. You, you know, you say that um, you, you don't think that he believes that he's that man anymore. And I want to drill into that for a second because, um, you know, I, I work with a lot of 
top athletes, um, you know, people that are very much in the public eye, A-listers, celebrities, what have you. And what's always fascinated me about a phenomenal athlete is not an ath- not a phenomenal athlete that's able to be good once, but someone who dominates a sport over a, over a prolonged period of time. Someone like a Lance Armstrong, a Michael Jordan, you know, um, uh, Tom Brady. Um, and that mindset of, of belief or who you are. I mean, talk a little bit about the mindset. Like, how, how do you stay focused? Because, look, you might not have the fame and the fortune of a Conor McGregor, but you are still a very well-known fighter. Yep. Um, you're a very well-respected fighter. You're very much in the public eye. Um, you've had to now be camp-ready three different times, um, you know, for this fight. At some point, what gets inside of, of your head? Where was the tipping point for you where you said... I got to go back to doing what Michael Chandler's dreamed of doing. And whether it means I put this fight off or not, this is the tipping point for me. I'm going back to my, my dream of chasing the title. Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good question. Cause it's been an, an evolution over this last, you know, year, year and a half. And there's been times where I was hundred percent focused. Yeah, it's got to uh, get in your head. Yeah. It's a hundred, hundred percent. Hey, this fight's happening. We're good. It's going to go. And then all of a sudden, he would throw a tweet out or it would be, you know, the media would say this or some report would come out and then it's like, okay, now the fight looks like it's in jeopardy. But then ultimately we got the fight booked. Um, and I trained, I mean, that's, that's just one thing about me. And, and it's my journey in mixed martial arts has been very, very unique. And I love my journey. And it's why I love fighting in the UFC so much because mm. I know what it's like outside of the UFC. And I've fought so many guys that you and everybody else listening right now, they're not household names. They don't, know who these a lot of guys that You're i have fought like in my strike past. force days bellator and strike force and bellator yet i still trained just as disciplined just as hard left no stone unturned never cut corners did everything perfectly to the best of my ability when i was fighting a nobody or i was making 500 bucks in my first fight or i was making very little money very little promotion in a smaller promotion outside of the ufc all the way into now coming to the ufc training just as hard and just as disciplined for world titles or now fighting uh charles Oliveira, or if i would have fought connor yeah so to me it's it's not about um who you're fighting or where you're fighting or when you're fighting dictating how you prepare or, how, or the professionalism that you keep it's the standard that you have set and it's a non-negotiable and it doesn't matter so mm. once once the fight kind of felt th- fell through for the first time um well not for the first time but this last time with the broken oh, the pinky second toe time or the third time yeah yeah this this pinky toe yeah um oh the pinky, the toe. pinky toe that was that my was, favorite one that was yeah I, I i talked to hunter campbell about that and i was like what was going through your mind when you you know saw connor come out and it was a broken pinky toe and he was just you know he was like i'll no comment right yeah because ultimately before that at, at, as of right now in my entire career i've never missed weight and i've never pulled out of a fight never pulled out of a wrestling match never did not show up and, and compete mm-hmm. um Never that, miss weight. Never miss weight. Really? That is a, D1 for... Oh, never. Wow. And, and that's hundreds of hundreds of times. Wow. Um, and it's because it's it's not that hard to just do the right thing. Mm-hmm. If you do the right thing... Well, if you're disciplined, you do it, it's not that hard. Yeah, yeah. right? You know? Um, and like I said, I don't take a lot of credit for it. Mike and Betty Chandler from High Ridge, Missouri, they built me into the young man that I am be, mm-hmm. through osmosis and watching them and how hard they, they train or how, how hard they worked. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just ingrained in me. Um, but a guy who had never pulled out of a fight before... Connor and has fought injured. He's got his little documentaries that came out and then he always showed every time he had an injury or broken this or broken that. Yeah, which, I, rem- I remember the yeah. picture of the toe. And, and I mean, I'm a human biologist, not a, I'm not a surgeon or a doctor, but I got plenty, plenty of orthopedic friends. They're like, you, when you break a toe like that, you tape it to the next toe and you, yeah. you move on. Like, yeah, I, I kind of made the I joke. my toe stuck, you know, going to the bathroom and hit kicking the, yeah. you know, kicking the plate on my bed, and, yeah. you know. And I, I, I made the joke I still too. still went to work. I made the joke too about, isn't there a certain segment of the population who has that like hanging toe syndrome <laughs> yeah, where like yeah. the toe doesn't even touch the ground? So you're like, you basically don't even have a pinky toe or some of the people <laughs> don't, right? Um, well, not but me. I, I got gorgeous feet. My, you got, everybody talks feet. about, yeah, I really. I mean, if I took shoes. my shoes off right now, it would throw the whole podcast (laughs) off because then that'd be like the biggest thing the biggest focal point yeah um but i uh you know so he had never pulled out of a fight and i was just obviously i'm just like hey it's it gives me an opportunity and i think you never quite know how your legacy and how your story is being told because you're just living it and then someday people are going to look back and see the way that i operated and how i handled myself throughout this process i agree with and i believe it's going to be a shining light to how people handle adversity how and it would be a blueprint for 
getting knocked down metaphorically yep. and picking yourself back up. That's always been my walk on mentality, my walk on story. And this is just another chapter in it, but the Chandler McGregor fight will happen eventually. It's just not now. Ever wonder how elite athletes recover faster and stay energized? It's the science of cold water therapy. Hi, I'm Gary Brecca, and I want to introduce you to Plunge. Plunge helps to soothe your sore muscles, boost your energy levels, and improve mental clarity. It's a powerful way to support your immune function and enhance your mood. Ready to transform your health? Take the plunge. Change your life. Visit plunge.com and shop now. Now let's get back to the Ultimate Human podcast. And I think, you, you know, you epitomize to me that type of fighter that people want to see win. I think that you know, fighters take on all kinds of personalities and, and people follow them because they love them or they hate them. But, you know, when you look at back at your career, your career reminds me of, you know, the, the, the starving young startup entrepreneurial career that actually built it into a, a you know, a billion dollar company or, you know, that, that, that struggling marriage that wasn't really handed anything that just turned out to be this, this beautiful relationship. And, you know, when you go back over your career and you see that, you know, you walked on as a division one wrestler. I mean, I, I don't think that many people understand if they're not in it, if they, if they haven't played D one sports, what it means to walk on at, at a, at a division one school. I mean, you mm -hmm. weren't there on a full ride. You weren't there on a scholarship. Um, I mean, you had a, you had a solid career as a high school wrestler, but to go into division one, I mean, that's like your D one to the NFL, right? I yep. mean, that's the big game. And to, and to walk on and have been as successful. And then as you moved into your, the rest of your career, you know, I, as I looked at it, I saw, you know, someone that rose through the ranks in Bellator, for example, and then left Bellator at the height and then came in and fought the toughest five fighters in the UFC. I mean, it was like, almost like, give this dude a break. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, it almost, it, and it, and it seems like, Every time that you've championed in your life, you've championed or conquered in your life, it's it's not something that was handed to you. Yeah. And it was and it was taking a huge risk and it was betting on yourself. And I and I thank God every single day that for some reason, this little 18-year-old kid who didn't believe in himself took the opportunity to bet on himself to walk onto the University of Missouri because Did tell me what that was like. It was I honestly, I honestly, it doesn't actually compute in my head because I know for a fact that I didn't believe that I deserved to be at the University of Missouri. And mom mm. and dad were telling me not to and, mm. and coaches around me and 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 teammates and everybody from my little small town in High Ridge, Missouri was was like, dude, what are you this is this is a crazy Because you like, just why hadn't you? wrestled at that level because you were can I say small town wrestler? Yeah, small town and, and very, very average ish. You know, like I was, I was ranked high in the state my senior year, but still fell short, sab sabotaged myself, didn't win a state title. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I had scholarship offers from smaller schools local locally. And obviously that would have paid for my, my schooling. So my parents, you know, probably wanted me to do that. Right. Yeah. Um, but so there was everybody around me saying, this is probably a bad idea because you either, you're either a going to not going to make it. You're not, you're going to quit. B, you're, oh, you're going to ride the bench and just go there and be a human punching bag. Why why go do that when you can go maybe be a starter at Missouri Baptist or Linwood or one of these other schools? And thank God for some reason, this 18-year-old little kid was like, no, I'm going to go chase that dream. I'm going to go climb that mountain. And that was the first time I bet on myself. Mm. And obviously it worked out well. Um, ended up becoming an All-American in the hardest weight class in the country. Um, and a four year, four year starter, four year national qualifier, three year team wow. captain, just, just a guy who started at the bottom coach didn't even know my name, didn't even mm -hmm. look in my direction, didn't even talk to me the, the whole first year, the lowest guy on the totem pole. And yeah. but I think I still, I still am that guy. I still, even when I beat Charles Oliveira and then I go beat Islam and I'm the UFC champion and we sit here and we do this podcast again and we'll run it again. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, I still have this yearning to, I have this yearning to continue to find the best version of myself, but I also don't see myself as better than anybody else because I know where I started and, and starting at the bottom yeah. and starting at the bottom of the totem pole was the greatest gift I ever could have gotten in my entire life. And then betting on myself to come over to the UFC when it was a huge risk. And I had that, I had great money, great platform, great relative security in Bellator. Yeah. And I said, I just, I'm not going to be able to sleep at night unless I go climb up, climb this crazy. Cause mountain. that was the next, I mean, that, that yeah. strike force to Bellator, Bellator yeah. to the UFC. But and that, I mean, well, that, and that's what I told Hunter too. Like you said, I fought the toughest five guys. I sat in yeah, his office I mean, here in Vegas and I said, Hey, I'm completely content coming over here. And I want you to throw me against the toughest guys right away. And if I lose my first two fights and you need to cut me, that's fine. But at least I can prove to myself. I need to prove to myself mm. either I am, I am who I say I am 
or I'm not. And now here we Where are. Where was Oliveira in that lineup? Um, um, he was uh, number two or number three. He was, uh, yeah, number two. Well, yeah, because Khabib was the champion. He was about to fight Justin Gaethje. I came in as the backup, and mm -hmm. then Oliveira was ranked second, but really mm -hmm. ranked third. And then that was the reason because uh, Khabib retires. Poirier and Connor were stuck in their trilogy, so they yeah. had to fight each other. So then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. now that was me and Oliveira fighting for the title in my second fight because it all worked out perfectly serendipitously. So it's it's just so funny how God keeps the door closed and you're trying to break through it and you mm -hmm. take a sledgehammer to it and you're trying to kick it down and you, you're asking him, why won't this door open? I deserve it. I deserve it. But it might be the right thing. It just might not be the right time. Yeah. Right? So yeah. When, when the door Patience finally... Patience is not a virtue that a lot of great athletes and competitors have yeah, either, right? Exactly. So when the door opened, it didn't just open. It 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 was wide. It was completely wide open and, it, and I walked into the greatest scenario I ever could have asked for coming mm. into the UFC. And it was just... It was perfect. Did you have any mentors or guides? Um, you know, I, I, wrestling is a very individual sport. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems like nobody's getting you up in the morning. Nobody's putting you to bed at night. I mean, you're you're very motivated. It's not a team sport as like other sports. It yeah. is because your 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 team you know wrestles wrestles on behalf of your your institution. But it's not like an organized sport where those days where you're not motivated. Yeah. Um, you're motivated because you got to show up for everybody else. You only have to show up for yourself. Yep. And I have I have a lot of respect for that because people that find that that motivation, that self discipline, it's more probably more discipline than, than than motivation. You can't wait to be motivated. You just have to. You know that you have to do these things every single day in order to compete at the level that you're at. Where did the motivation come from? Where did the guidance come from? Like who were you looking up to and and getting guidance or advice from at that it's a good time. good question so to start with the and this is one of my superpowers i believe and and why me walking on and being the lowest guy on the totem pole was so important because mm. i was so grateful to be there mm. so you had blue wow. chip, that's yeah, a big blue chip statement. recruits state champions studs guys guys who were sitting there with 15 different scholarship offers they're they're the cat's meow they walk into the university of missouri like okay hey i'm here take care of me but then all mm. of a sudden the grind punches them in the mouth and they realize, ooh, this is tough. I don't really want to be here anymore. I'd rather go work for my dad back in Pennsylvania or whatever. Whereas me, I walked in like, shoot, if anybody even talks to me or even knows who I am or even wants to drill with me, man, I'm excited. I'm grateful to be here every single day. I woke mm. up, was never, ever late. I was always, I immediately started becoming a, a leader on the team because I just, I did the right things, but I did more than what was asked of me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have to be told what, was right and wrong, right? And I was just so grateful to be there. So that's that's one of my superpowers is I still, to this day, I'm so grateful that I get to do what I do every single day. And I'm 38 years old. You're not supposed to be fighting at this high of a level at 38 years old. That's right. And with all of the fights I've had, the wars that I've had, the awards that I've won, the world championships and the ups and the downs and the, the tears and, the, and all of the things I've been through, but I'm still so grateful for the opportunity. Um, yeah. And with that, I had some great mentors at in, in University of Missouri with Tyron Woodley, I wrestled with, who ended up becoming a UFC champion. Ben Askren, who was multiple time world champion outside of the UFC, came to the UFC and fought a couple fights. Um, and great, great coaches. I had a Bible study leader named Bus Tarbox, who was the first person who started to open my mind to, because I was, I grew up very, hey, we're in High Ridge, Missouri, and if you have money, if you're, or if you have status, or you have nice things, or you have a nice big house, or whatever, you're probably a pretentious. Uh, you know, person who who isn't isn't uh, full of um, giving, right? And then gratitude, he's, gratitude yeah. and and also just uh, generosity, right? You want to keep it all to yourself. That's how people get rich. They just keep it all to themselves, and they're very selfish. And I saw the way that he served his wife, and I saw the way he served his two daughters. He would he we'd have Bible study on every Tuesday night. By the time we would get there, he would be they would just get done eating dinner, and he was sitting there with his daughters, doing homework with them, and just loving on them and serving them. And he was mm -hmm. such a great servant leader, and he was so generous. Everybody in the whole community in Columbia, Missouri knew who he was. And all of a sudden, I started thinking, wait a second, he's an orthopedic surgeon, owns an orthopedic practice, wow. very successful, very, very successful, has money, has status, has nice things, yet he has the biggest heart I've ever seen. And he started to open that up, started to open that in me to think, wait a second, where am I playing small? Where am I playing scarcity? Where am I playing lack? And that really started to open it up. And then getting exposed to the kids from California, kids from Pennsylvania, coast to coast around the entire country and seeing different ways that everybody grew up. And it started to just really mold me into the young man that I was. And then 
full of gratitude and just I would run through that brick wall for you if you wanted me to. And, and I will do it harder and faster. And I'm willing to die for you, coach. Like that wow. was the kind of guy I am. And I'm still like that, mm. which is kind of dangerous and scary because yeah. I, I am that guy inside the cage. Um, right. So that's kind of the origin. You know, of that's, it. It's, it sounds to me, this is kind of where faith enters the picture. Yeah. Right. And, um, and maybe talk a little bit about how that's shaped your role as an athlete, um, mm -hmm. and your aspirations and, um, your tenacity, maybe in those moments where you don't have, um, that mentor by your side and you're, you're a little bit alone in your decisions. Cause at the end of the day, you know, fighting is a very individual sport. I mean, you got difficult decisions to make on your own, mm -hmm. um, for you, you know, you got to make decisions for yourself and not necessarily for the media, not necessarily for the fans. Um, if you were doing that, you'd still be waiting on the counter fight. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. um, well, where, where does, where does faith fall into the picture for you? It's, your, it's obviously, yeah, it's the cornerstone of of who I am and and what I what I do, right? Cuz because being a fighter is great, it's what I do, but it's not who I be. Like who who I be is is a man who was put on this earth to reach people and to serve people and to be a servant leader and also be a, a shining light. Um you know, I always say like fighting is my my shiny object that gets people to look and they say, "Oh man, he's cool. He's got cauliflower ears and he fights in a cage." And I <laughs> saw his highlights, right? You do have cool cauliflower ears. Oh, well, thank you. I actually uh, like those. Right? You know, so it's so that's the shiny object that gets yeah. people to look, but then they then they're able to say, "Okay, now that I'm looking, let me go ahead and peel back the layers of who this guy is and how he operates. And speaking about my faith, I don't, I don't like to do it in a way that is necessarily unbecoming or, or, or too over, uh, be guess, preachy over, or yeah, too, you know, I just, I want One of my favorite quotes about faith is preach the gospel at all times, but only use words when necessary. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I want to be a person who operates a certain way. And you say, there's something about that guy. I don't know exactly what it is. It's not, it's not necessarily as fighting, but there's something else going on. And I'm, he's a desirable individual for me to want to look to. Right. Um, and I just know it's been revealed to me so many times over my entire life in all these different seasons, how God has had me in the palm of his hand through every single season. And even the seasons where you know, I know you don't see it at the time. No. And even the seasons where I questioned him and even the seasons where it seemed like the devil was winning. And even in the seasons where I feel like it's all about to go to hell in a handbasket and it's all about to just catch on fire and everything's over. Right. When I lost three fights in a row and it's, mm. that's where you start to question things. But then you look back and you say, man, I needed that. That was exactly who I be, have become who I am today because of the man I was then. And I was so upset at that man and whether it be his lack or his, his scarcity or whatever it is, but I needed to be that man to know that I never want to be that man again, Yes, you know, and then just watching the way that he has galvanized me through the fires of what I've had to go through. And sometimes, sometimes it's, it's being the tallest nail that gets hammered and people, you know, pe people say, people <laughs> I say, like that. I'm going to start using that yeah, one, the tallest you know, nail that gets hammered. You know, the tallest yeah. nail always gets hammered first. Right. Yeah. And so and, true. And I, I like to be that guy. It's, it's a blessing. It's, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a really, really cool place to be because it means you're doing something impactful. You know, I've watched your career and you never really have been that guy that's played the victim mentality. You know, I've, I've, you hear it a lot, even from the most accomplished fighters, you know, you've never talked about getting robbed. You've never talked about being taken advantage of. You never talked about not being given what you deserve. You've, um, and you know, you could look at, you could take a step back and say, well, you know, there's, there's fighters that came into the UFC, Alex Pereira, for example, um, um, comes in and gets four fights in the time that uh, goes from virtual obscurity to, yep. you know, a household name in, 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 the, in the fight business, um, you know, in the fight game during the time frame that you were waiting on this one fight, but you yeah. never, you know, or took that woe is me attitude, you know, you never played that victim card. I think at some point you just reached that tipping point and you said, I've got goals and aspirations that, that, I'm, I'm going to go after and I'm going to put Connor to the side. And like you said, I like what you said the other day. I'm, I'm not, uh, Connor's not my next opponent, but I'm, I'm his. Yeah. Um, and that was, a, you know, that, that statement says a lot about who you are. You're like, I'm not running from this fight. I'm re still ready for this fight, but I, at some point I've got to do what God put me on this earth to do. And that's to be the best version of myself. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I, I've, you know, I, I, I study a lot about the, um, the human mindset and, and I study how it affects, uh, you know, the cells in our body because, you know, for a long time people would talk about the universal law of energy and um, these concepts of your emotional state having no impact on your, 
on your physical health. But we know that to not be true now. Mm -hmm. We know that what goes on up here has a lot to do with what goes on um, down here. And our mindset and our mentality and what we think about and whether we wake in gratitude has a lot to do with how healthy, how conditioned, how focused we are. And you've been able to maintain, in my opinion, this fight ready level of conditioning over, over a long period of time. I mean, tell me how that grind when the goal keeps taken, get taken, gets taken away from you. Yeah. How do you just keep up that grind? I think once again, it's just gratitude. Cause it's, you get after it, man. Yeah. I mean, I've seen your, your, your workouts. I mean, they're nasty. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, I think it's um, just gratitude. And I mean, it's, it's so hard and it's, you know, it's, there's a reason that depression is the number one disability in, in the United States. Isn't that true? Right. Yeah, depression has now become one of the number one disabilities and it's, don't get me started on that. That's, know, a, exactly, whole, that's but, a whole podcast. Talking about, exactly. Yeah, you're right. But, but this idea that we can sit here, you know, and we're both Americans in this beautiful country with all the freedoms and liberties. And, and you can go down the list of a billion things that we have to be thankful for. Even mm. the fact that I have two capable arms and two capable legs that millions, and I mean millions and millions of people would trade mm -hmm. to give anything to trade. Have a hot shower. I right. Mean, to I mean, trade, just simple things. Yes. To trade places with me. And I, and I look at it as though, to give anything less than my best is to sacrifice those gifts, these gifts that I've been given. And I have been given so many great gifts. And Mike and Betty Chandler, my mom and dad, High Ridge, Missouri, worked two and three jobs, were up every single morning, never complained, never cut cor Are corners. Are your parents still around? Yeah. They are? Oh, yeah. Nice. They're, they're, and, and that's the thing. I, I get so much credit for how hard I work and how disciplined I am. And yes, I have to do it. I have to make the decision every mm -hmm. single day to do the right thing. But I almost don't have a choice because it just becomes so natural to me because of how the example that my parents set for me, you know, mm -hmm. and it's so whether, whether I have a fight booked or I don't have a fight booked, I still have another day to live. Yeah. You know, I still have another hour to live. I still have relationships and I still have a choice every single day to do the right things or do the wrong things. And the simple fact of the matter is we all know the right things and the wrong things to do. It just, are you willing to admit that you do, or you don't know those things, yeah. you know, you can't play ignorance is bliss or you can't play, um, ignorance to the things that you know you need to do yeah. you got to do what you need to do instead of you what you want to do because too many people people are just driven by emotion so i take the emotion out of it and say here's my standard that i have set and it, i have a i have a duty to myself mm -hmm. to my family to my my creator to my onlookers to my this my one life that i get to live to do the right thing so it's just this intrinsic hope and peace coupled with a tenacity yeah you've that, been tenacious about yeah, everything in fact there's a yeah. really funny story i want to ask you about that i oh, heard I, I actually hope it's true because it's a great story my wife loved it um about how you met your your wife oh gosh yeah. um and like, tenacious <laughs> tenacious Slash dude, stalker literally emailed her i think it's illegal in 14 states yeah what you did but um but it worked <laughs> out for you <laughs> yeah <laughs> but you uh you went full-blown stalker mode you emailed her every day for what two years not not every day but, but well i mean i would have if she would have responded to me i would have emailed her back every day but she <laughs> she being the wonderful very self-confident, very self-sufficient person that she is, didn't need me or want me or any man for that matter because she was married to medicine. She was doing an 80-hour 80, 80 a week critical care res residency at the University of Missouri ER, and she was living her dream. That was what she wanted to do, and she didn't need me or anybody else. Mm. One of my favorite biohacks outside of breath work by far is mineral salts, Baja Gold Sea Salt. It's got all of the trace minerals that the body needs. You know, most of us are not just protein deficient, meaning amino acid deficient or fatty acid deficient. We are mineral deficient. So a quarter teaspoon of this in water first thing in the morning will make sure that you get all of the essential minerals that you need. It tastes amazing. In fact, I made a steak today. I actually made a grass fed steak with grass fed butter and I put just mushrooms and a little bit of rosemary and I sprinkled Baja Gold Sea Salt all over the top. Try it. It'll be your new favorite for cooking too. It's the cheapest and one of my favorite biohacks. I don't know, a 15 or $20 bag of this will probably last you five years. And it's literally the world's best biohacking secret. Now let's get back to the Ultimate Human podcast. Um, so she would take like two months to to respond to my email and I'm checking two it every months. I'm checking it every day, checking it every day. Cause once I got the first one, I'm like, you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm just so like, we're checking every day. we are checking every day. And then as soon as it would come through, boop, boop, I'd email her back and then so she wait, took two and months wait. and you took two minutes. Yep. Yep. Oh, less, probably less than two minutes. Um, but the origin story is, you know, going back to Bus Tarbox, my Bible study leader, his Bible study leader was a man named Kent Willett, who had a phenomenal reputation around town. Um, 
And he was also a dentist. And I got this tooth knocked out, mm. thank God, uh, in college. And I went to his dental office. And I knew I knew of his reputation. And I saw pictures of, it, of him on the wall. And I saw this cute little brunette girl with these beautiful dark brown eyes. And a was, picture? Yeah, a picture on the wall. Mm. And I said, that girl's beautiful. And, if, and that's his daughter. And if she's anything like him, I want to marry her someday. And wow. so then... Thank God through the beauty of like a Facebook, I was able, and I went and got my tooth fixed. I didn't go get creepy and say, Hey, your daughter's beautiful. Can I take her out for a date or anything? Yeah. <laughs> and you didn't send her your picture yeah. with your tooth still yeah, out. No, I, yeah, I got, it's still there. Um, <laughs> and uh, so then, you know, I looked her up on Facebook and thank God we had a bunch of mutual friends. And then I, I went to another Bible study that was more of a, um, a college age Bible study. And everyone kept bringing this girl's name up. They kept saying mm. her name, Brie Willett, Brie Willett. And because everybody knew her and I was like, that's that girl. Like that is that girl that I saw in that picture. And now I've been kind of seeing on Facebook and seeing if I'm ever going to run into her. Cause she, she went to PA school in Illinois and she was just coming back around that when I was in college. Um, or I guess she was in college, but she was out of town. I had actually been to her house. She wasn't there. Mm. I went to her house for a guy's birthday party who was in our Bible study. Mm. And yes, in the back of my mind, I was like, I'm definitely going to that Bible study because it's at Dr. Willett's house and maybe Bree will be in town. She never was. But the funny thing was, I pictured myself fishing in the pond in their backyard. Like someday I'm going to fish on this pond mm. because I'm going to marry this girl. And now I married her and I fish on the pond. <laughs> that um, is so so awesome. it's crazy. But that finally, is amazing. Yeah, yeah, finally, she, uh, we kind of Facebooked friended each other. I sent her a message on Facebook. Then she said, Hey, I'm deactivating my Facebook account because I'm applying for residencies. So we started emailing and she would email back like every two months. And then finally I hounded her enough to say, Hey, can we go to coffee together? And she finally said yes. And then since January 20, 24th of 2013, when she walked into Caldy's coffee, we've been together ever since. 2013. Man, 2013. That's amazing. When did you guys get married? Uh, 2014. 2014. Wow. Yeah. So we, we were, we were dating for 11 months, engaged for five months. Wow. And I, I, now I tricked her and I trapped her. <laughs> she ain't getting yeah. out. Yeah. She, she ain't getting, getting out. out. She so. don't know how tenacious yeah. you are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then you've, um, you know, you've gone on to, you're, you're building a beautiful family. Mm -hmm. Um, you've adopted two children. Yep. Um, and how did it come about the, you know, how does the discussion start that, um, you want to adopt, you know, children? I mean, yeah. how does that, um, that's uh so that started because we were in San Diego because we when we got married or when we were first dating I had just moved to San Diego and we we both we got married in San Diego bought our first house in San Diego so you you were fighting then. yeah yeah I was fighting right. and she had never seen a fight before she never oh, wasn't wow. following it like which was good um I liked that about her um and did you just lay that on her in the beginning when she was like well, well, well you know well what do you do and she's like I'm 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 working in the ER and you're like well yeah. I actually yeah. I fight in a cage. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, that was, you, I think that was well, the problem, which is, which is awesome. Like, you know, we have this preconceived notions of who fighters are, how they operate, what their goals and what their morals are and what type of people they are. So right. she was kind of like, well, hmm. number one, I don't need a man or want a man right now. I'm married to medicine. And I definitely don't want that guy. I never want to be a professional athlete's wife. Number one, number two, a professional athlete who fights in a cage for a living, there's probably some red flags that I probably am not interested in. So I think that's why it took so long. That's obviously. what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Two so, months to respond to it, an email. It, exactly. Um, <laughs> but eventually my, my character or who I was kind yeah. of shown through, I guess, in my, some of my emails. But um, once we started dating, we were in San Diego. We were laying on a little blanket at this cool little dog park watching planes fly over. And she first told me, she said, yeah, you know, I've always, always wanted to adopt. Mm. And, and it caught me off guard a little bit because I had never really thought about it. Right. And quite frankly, I was like, well, I've never thought about this, but I'll do anything to marry you. Like I'm completely on board with that. Yeah. Um, cause ever since she was a teenager, like 14 years old, she had it on her heart to adopt. She used to, she used to serve at an inner city mission in Columbia, Missouri. Wow. She used to go on these mission trips to Jamaica and she just loved children. Um, and but she also knew she, she, when you go on mission trips, obviously you see the hurt in the world and you see fatherlessness and you see, Man, you talk about you see orphans and you see, yeah, you know, and, and so I think that was always ingrained in her and everybody around her knew Brie will it someday. She said, you know, if I, if I ever get married and I marry a good man, I want to adopt children. I mm. want that. That's how I want to build a family. And, uh, you know, obviously 
after praying about it and, and seeking wise counsel about it and thinking about it a lot, obviously I was like, hey, I'm on board. Let's, you know, let's do it. And we adopted our first son in And then what was the distance between adopting the two children? Um, Hap was 2017 and then Ace was 2022. So it's like five years. Wow. And yeah. they're not siblings. No. Nope. Yeah, that's no. amazing, man. Yep. God bless you, dude. This is mm -hmm. incredible. So I want to switch gears a little bit because um, I want to talk about uh, what you do in addition to your your typical fighting regimen to to have your body in top physical condition. Um, you know, I mean, you're obviously a physical specimen. Um, so you're you're no stranger, obviously, growing up. You know, D one wrestler, high school wrestler, D one wrestler, cage fighter, but you're getting you know, 38 years old, mm -hmm. um, you have to pay a lot more attention to recovery than a fighter does when they're 21 years old, 22 yep. years old. I mean, um, at that age, you can't be killed by a bullet. Yep. And, um, yeah. you know, and the knees and hips and shoulders and rotator cuffs and the low back just don't, don't ache the way they do yep. when, when you get older and you've, 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 you put some miles on yourself in the ring. You've, you know, you've had a lot of, um, you know, a lot of contact, a, a lot of heavy weights. Um, talk a little bit about what your regimen is like. I mean, well, obviously we, we do a lot um, together with 10X Health, but mm -hmm. what is your regimen that you would say for recovery is is outside of what you see going on with with your peers? I mean, most people are strength training and obviously doing their jujitsu and stand up and what yeah. have you. Um, I would say, I mean, my, my emphasis towards strength training is so much higher than everyone else in the sport. I believe, mm -hmm. I believe, I believe they use it as a, a very small supplement to the sport, but mm -hmm. I, I believe my body is so durable because I've, I've put it under heavy load constantly mm -hmm. day after day after day since I was in high school. Um, and obviously the college wrestling, the college wrestling environment, uh, we lifted weights and we lifted heavy and we were constantly wrestling because in these, in this contact sport where you're constantly getting pulled on and contortionists and elbows and, and joints and stuff going different ways mm -hmm. and load bearing in these weird little positions. It's so important to be strong in those positions. So, um, strength training to me has been a superpower for me, probably mm -hmm. doing it too much in a lot of people's eyes. Yeah. Right. Yet I still keep my explosiveness. I'm, st I'm still able to make weight cause I don't put on a, a ton of muscle mass on. I have a good amount of muscle mass, but it's also my body armor. Right. right? Um, and then also, yeah, similar to what you said about being young, as soon as I hit 27 years old or so, I realized I was starting to get closer to the end of the career than I was the beginning of the career, which started at 2022. 20, and that's when I really started emphasizing body work, getting body work every single week mm. and, and, and my own manual therapy via a roller. So, so I'm one of the only, one of the only guys at my gym who started rolling out every single day before practice um, for 20, 30 minutes, getting there early, getting a good little stretch and actually rolling it out, getting my body moving. And then all of a sudden the young, young guys start kind of seeing me do it and they're all getting on their rollers and stuff now. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so those you do, two you're things in the rolling, sure. you're doing red light. Yes. And um, then, so then now with when we, what we have been starting to work together, um, the hypermax oxygen, yeah, the cold plunge, the pimp mat and the red light. Yeah. Um, and that this last camp, um, as we talked about, this was the best I have ever felt in my entire life. Yeah. At 38 years old, yeah. 38, 38 years of scar tissue and all these things. Yeah. Um, my endurance, my recovery, the, and yes, there's, there's people always, talk about your gas tank because you have so much muscle. Yeah. They're like, you know, the later, the later he goes, the, you know, the more gas he gets because, you know, he's carrying all that muscle into yeah. late rounds. Yeah. Um, and you're, you're conscious of that and combating that mm -hmm. by trying to recover and increase your VO2 max and improve yep. your, improve your gas tank. Yeah, it's been it's been awesome. Um and I have I have it the Hypermax in in my house in Florida where I mm -hmm. do my training camps and then also in Nashville. So even when I bounce back and forth, I've got everything set up and yeah. then the red light and the pimp. It's it's been it's taken because you know, like you said, speaking about the highest level athletes, we all to a certain extent, we all train hard. We're all pretty disciplined. There's certain little differentiators, but how right. do you get that one, that extra little 1% better that yeah. whether it's explosiveness or cardio or, um, endurance, or even more important than all of those things is recovery because your current workout is only as effective as your recovery was from the previous workout yeah. or the previous damage that you have done to yourself. So every single day, just the revolving door of redlining yourself 
and then recovering and then yeah. redlining and recovering. And I think we're so good at redlining ourselves. I mean, um, you know, most athletes have their strength training down. They have their, their stand-up training, their jujitsu training down, but it's whether or not their body is keeping up with the, with the, damage that they're making and yeah. one of my f favorite recovery devices is the is a red light therapy bed and i know when you started yep. using it you saw a parabolic rise in in your recovery hydrogen water is another one good call i'll fire that up right now <laughs> um yeah so i yeah i just started doing this um a couple months ago now yeah. and just having one of these you'll notice Every delayed day, onset time. muscle soreness you know inflammation um recovery joints especially we i, I even have um a little surprise that I got for you to help help close that Ooh. that that last one one percent gap. Can we can we bring that over here? I like surprises. Um, I know you. <laughs> these are recovery surprises. Yes. Um. So, um. You know, I'm I'm obviously enormous fan of the PEMF, the pulse electric magnetic field. It, you know, keeps your body alkaline using the EWAT, the exercise with oxygen therapy. Ooh. This is my newest recovery love right here, um, brother. You're gonna love this. Um, so this is a hydrogen. This is a hydrogen gas generator that you oh put goodness. into your um, bathtub, and what it does is it saturates the bath with hydrogen gas, just like this this water bottle will do, but just in higher concentration. And we know that this gas can go transdermal; it goes right through, through the, skin. the skin. So inflammation, um, circulation, what we call vasomotor activity, um, which is your micro micro um, circulation, you know, but only only. Uh, 30% roughly of our circulation is actually done by our heart. Um, the other 70% wow. of our circulation is done by something called vasomotor. It's kind of like a snake swallowing a mouse, right? It's the, it's the microvasculature moving blood around. So this is the way that we heal and repair at phenomenal Wolverine rates. I cannot wait to hear how you respond when you start 20 minutes a night, you're going to be in a, a hydrogen bath. Um, it feels great. It's that you keep yes. the bath at 102 degrees. We saturate it with hydrogen gas. You set down in that bath. That and gas just, goes right transdermal. And then it's, is it little, the little bubbles? It's just yeah, filling, it's a little micro bubbles, bubbles. kind of like the bubbles like you the bubbles see in, in here. It. Yeah. But, um, um, and oh, some of the things amazing. we talked about with your son too, I, yes. you know, I think this will that's, really, really help your son too with some of the topical that's things. That's a game changer because that's, that's a, one of the toughest things in my life right now with him. So, I know we, um, we've, we've had many a talk about it. And, um, if there's anything that I can do you know, to serve you. It's such a blessing to be able to work with you. Um, then, you know, I, I, I pray that this is going to be the solution that you, your son needs. And I really think that will be. Yes. Um, so I'm excited. Be, <laughs> sounds like I got, I got a date. Yep. 20 it's, minutes. It's kind of weird for a man day. to give something to another man to use in the bathtub, bath. but yeah. whatever. You know, yeah. <laughs> you're a UFC yeah. fighter. You're, sec you're secure in your manhood. I'm a, I can, I'm a tough guy. I, play I a can give you a bathing device. <laughs> I play a tough guy on TV. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it's better than a rubber ducky, man. That is awesome. Thank um, you. I'm, I'm excited yeah. about that. Hey guys, I'm really excited to announce this. Perfect Aminos has gotten a serious upgrade. They've added nucleotides, the building blocks of our nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. And this is important. We know essential amino acids are the building blocks of protein and collagen. Having all the essential amino acids in the correct ratio is necessary for complete protein synthesis without the caloric impact. But if we want perfect protein synthesis, we need to look at the process of protein synthesis itself. Because if the process is faulty, we won't get the correctly made protein, collagen, fibrin, or the red blood cells in our bloodstream or our muscles. We can even stop creation of specific proteins, which can affect us in so many different ways. Our DNA and our RNA are what direct protein synthesis, building new proteins. If our DNA or RNA get damaged from toxins, harmful bacteria, or just plain aging, we get faulty protein synthesis. So cells, enzymes, and hormones are less functional and we get premature aging. By adding nucleosides and nucleotides, the building blocks of the nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, our cells get exactly what they need to help repair faulty DNA and RNA and improve the process of protein synthesis itself. This is next level science and you need to try these. Now let's get back to the ultimate human podcast. So, so what, what can the fans, um, expect next out of, out of Michael Chandler? We got a date set now. Yep. November 16th, um, Madison square garden, the world's most iconic arena. Um, uh, the main event. So we're, Charles is, I, Charles and I are the co-main event, five rounds, mm -hmm. main event, 
Uh, I don't know if it's been announced yet, so I don't know if I should maybe say it. But obviously, there's speculation Connor out there fighting somebody else. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wouldn't that be the, the biggest Connor kick in the teeth, that. right? That would be the biggest kick. Yeah, in the teeth. you're like, oh, okay. Well, the, the main event. Connor yeah. McGregor and Usman. You know? I, at this point, nothing would surprise me. Yeah, but I know. Um, uh, so, and uh, he could fight himself maybe for the first time. Well, he loves years. himself enough to probably fight himself because <laughs> he's nobody else deserves to be on the ticket. Yeah. Um, and so that will be the you know the next step in me pursuing and also then achieving what i believe has been my my goal not just my goal but my destiny the entire yeah. time and maybe this is the way it was supposed to be the entire time beat charles Oliveira, which why beat him the Some, first time? something about redemption yeah too, why right? beat him the first time if there's even a better storyline you can beat him the second time and beat mm -hmm. him on a rematch and beat him at the right time mm -hmm. to then go fight for the title and then good old-fashioned passionate division one missouri american wrestling versus dagestani sambo islam uh mahachev who i have a ton of respect for but i believe i will i match up well against him mm -hmm. and then uh, i think so too and then and then if the connor fight happens if he can get his house in order that uh that is a fight that i obviously want because i want to i want to finish that chapter i feel like it's there's we waited and there was so many ups and downs and you know i went through things with it when it when it comes to all of the you know being away from my family but then not actually getting to fight was yeah, very tough a, like yeah I remember it wasn't we talked wasted about that. time i would never say it's wasted time right and, and anybody who's listening or you you've had times in your life where like man that was a wasted time but was it it wasn't really wasted time because of the man I became from it. Um, My wife and, and I talk about that a lot. A lot, yeah. of, a lot of the, a lot of the things at the time that we found to be, we built a business together, and and um, it wasn't always a successful business. And and along the road, you know, when you're when you're in a business with your spouse, um, your relationship is very much tied to the business. You have a good day at work, you have a good day at home. Yeah. You have a bad day at work, you have a bad day at home. I meet all kinds of people that are like, oh, you can separate your business from your personal life. No, you can't. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. No, you cannot. Well, and especially when you, when they're your biggest fan and you're their biggest fan and they're your mm. best friend, it's almost, you you want to always share every single thing with them, every single update, right? Yeah. And I've I found myself trying to protect my wife, Bree, a little bit more with not giving her half truths or half informations until a, everything is a hundred percent concrete because mm. this whole experience has been up and down in the media and everything. She's like, Hey, I heard this. And Hey, I heard that. Hey, what did Hunter, what did Dana say? But then it's like, yeah. So we were constantly in it and there was a constant update or non update. And sometimes no news was good news. And sometimes bad yeah. news was good and all of the different things. So yeah, we've gone over through that this last year and a half and what, so I want to close that chapter. I want to punch this guy in the mouth and I want to fin finish him. <laughs> yeah. um, but if it never happens, it never happens. One thing that I did also realize, and I've, al I've always realized it and I always knew it. I just wasn't public about it. I do not need Conor McGregor for my legacy. Very I do true. not need Conor McGregor. I don't need this Conor McGregor. I want this Conor McGregor fight. I desire this Conor McGregor fight. I think mm -hmm. it's great for my, me in a lot of different things uh, from a career, from a career wise to, to the biggest lights, to the most amount of money, to the, to the brightest lights, but I don't need it, but right. I want it. So um, that was one thing that, that I can finally stand firm in and say, Hey, I'm and passing Albert up on it. Is going to set you up for a title fight. I mean, and that's, that's ultimately your goal, which is right? the most I mean, important thing. Right. And, you know, because it, that's always the question. And the funny thing is there's always this public perception and there's all these lies out there when it comes to other fighters mm -hmm. of what their motivation would be. Everybody wants this Connor fight, by the way, every yeah. single one of them, whether they say they wouldn't fight him or they say Chandler's an idiot for waiting, everybody wants it. And I don't think a lot of the fighters would have the, the cojones to, to step away from this and go fight a killer in Charles Oliveira. Mm -hmm. I do believe I'm, I'm a guy who's making a, a decision that not a lot of guys would do, whether they say it or admit it or not. So right. I can put that feather in my cap and I can go out there at Madison Square Garden. I, I, know it's, I know it's hard to look to the other side of that fight, but if you were to take a, a, a view beyond the Oliveira fight after you finish him, who are you set up for to fight for a championship? Who are you set up with? I believe it's Islam. I think Islam. Islam Islam versus Armin is a fight that's already, it's not booked, but they're they're booked together. They just don't have a date. I believe that fight was supposed to happen in December. Mm -hmm. um, I heard there might have been an injury. Um, I want to fight Islam because I, I, I mean, believe. Is, Islam's going to, yeah, I mean. He's a stud, man. He's he's, stud. he's good. He's a dangerous fight. He's, he's gaining momentum. He's getting better with every single performance. Mm -hmm. um, Life is all about challenging yourself. Life is all about throwing yourself into a sets of circumstances that the probability of you losing or falling short is higher than you feel comfortable with. And I love wow. those type of opportunities. I love 
I'm not a prove a guy wrong type of guy. I'm not mm -hmm. like, hey, well, you say I can't do it. Well, watch me do it. I love that about Dana. That's kind of Dana's mentality. Yeah, that's why very much. That's why people love him, right? I'm yeah. not really that guy, but I'm more of a prove my supporters and my believers correct more than proving the doubters wrong type of guy. Yeah. But in these type of scenarios, it's the DAC would be stacked 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 against me and uh there'd be a lot of people who i would would not believe that i can beat islam just like nobody believed i would beat eddie alvarez whenever i came into the sport right and he was ranked number five and the whole world thought i was going to get beat by this big world-class guy and i looked across the cage and said hey this guy's better than me at fighting he's got more skills than me at fighting but i was destined to be here and i'm about to beat this guy and i believe really? i believe that i remember thinking that i remember thinking that, really? and I, but i also remember thinking i was crazy i also remember thinking why do you believe you're about to beat this guy he's beaten all of these guys, he's ranked number three, number five in the world. You're not even supposed to be in the same cage with him. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, and and really going back to, you know, playing small and sabotaging myself, I did that to myself in the sport of wrestling so many times that I made a promise to myself. I remember being at this the this arena in, in St. Louis and I took my, my uh, singlet straps off for the last time. And I remember the relief that I had that finally this thing is over because I kept putting so much pressure on myself, but then also the hope that I had because I knew I was going into mixed martial arts and I made a promise to myself that I was going to stop playing small and I was going to never self-sabotage myself again. Yeah. And then 18 months later, I'm standing in an octagon or standing in a, a Bellator cage against opposite Eddie Alvarez, a guy who was arguably people thought he would go to the, would go to the UFC and become UFC champion. And right. ultimately he did. Mm -hmm. Um, and I beat him that night. And it wow. was just, I, I stopped that playing That must small. have been. You know, I've often really, like, truly wondered what it's like to be in that octagon for a fight. I don't care how many fights you've had, but when that cage locks and the crowd is going crazy and you know there's somebody on the other side of that octagon who's actually only there to hurt you. Yeah. I mean, that's really... They have one goal. They have one and goal. And it involves you, and it's, yeah. not a, it's not a good it's thing. It's not a good ending for you. <laughs> no. And, um, you know, on a much different scale, you know, I, I've done a lot of public speaking, and I don't know that I've ever gotten completely used to walking onto a big stage, you know, and I've, I've spoken on, you know, small ballrooms, but I've spoken in stadiums that have had, you know, basketball stadiums with 30,000 people. And for me, when I'm, you know, when I walk out on that stage and I look at the crowd, you know, I... I I get this um, sort of tightness in my chest and I realize, shoot, I, I, I got to actually say something. Yep. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm by myself. All the eyes are on me. Yep. And I don't have the pressure. Nobody, nobody's actually there to hurt me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just put, put us in that, put us in that moment. Um, yeah. What, what, what that's like, cause that's gotta be the best and the worst and the craziest. And I, I mean, it's gotta be a drug like, nothing else in the world it is yeah it, it is and and the beautiful thing about it is is i know i was born for this because mm. because when i go in there there is no there is no apprehension there is no, no lack you, of you're, you're calm yeah i'm just so calm because everyone's like hey man do you, how, what do you listen to what do you got to do how, how you got to get pumped up and i'm like the last thing i want to do is get pumped up i i know i'm in the right state of mind when i'm listening to music and tears are starting to fill up in my eyes because i'm so grateful for what I get to do and who I get to do it for. Um, wow. And I think about my wife and I think about my kids and I think about, I think about what I get to do in this masterpiece that I'm painting for my sons to see and my kids to see mm. and the millions of people around the world that get to see it. Um, that's where I want to be. And it's, it's, you don't want, you don't think, well, tears in your eyes and your heart full. I and you're coming right yeah, now. Yeah. Right. Awesome, you don't man. really think it. that's, that's where you want to be if you're going to go get into a physical altercation in your underwear, <laughs> you know, with no, barely any clothes on with yeah. no shoes in front of millions of people locked into a cage. You wouldn't think that, but that's exactly where I feel I need to be. That's where that's mm. my homeostasis to be able to get into my flow state. Um, and when that door closes, there's this, you know, you've been to so many fights now, you, you know what the octagon yeah. kind of smells like. Cause you, you, yeah. you're right there. That smell yeah, that smell put turns me into a different person. And it happens to me every time I go to the fights, you know, I'll be at the sphere tonight and, and, you, and you'll smell it and you'll smell the air and you'll feel the air and you'll feel that you'll feel the energy. And you, you know, obviously tonight the guard is down because I get to go watch the fights mm -hmm. and not actually have to fight. But that smell brings about something in me that I just become a, a little bit of a different person. And the lights are bright. 
and you can hear the chatter and you can hear the cheers and you can feel the energy and it's it's so but then cool. does it all kind of then it, yeah then does it, it just tune out and you're only your opponent in front of you or yeah. are you ever distracted by somebody just bellowing through the cage because i mean there's some people sitting next to me at these fights that are yelling their ass off yeah right um, <laughs> most of the time and, not and mainly because my fights are so crazy there's there's never all of my fights are are edge of your seat type of non-stop action non-stop right. violence type of fights so right. there's never a lot of time where it's like you never hear footsteps in my fights whereas right. there's some <laughs> fights where you can hear the footsteps because the yeah. crowd's kind of they're just watching two guys point fight and they're not watching one guy try to you know absolutely damage somebody like yeah. i the way that i fight so most of the time it's so loud in there that you're just you're just focused on targets and threats and the two arms and two legs and, and a head and the torso mm. of a body um and obviously there's the referee is in there you never see the referee you know obviously because they're good at getting out of the way but yeah you're just trying to limit your distractions and, and honing in aim small miss small on your opponent wow that is amazing, man. I mean, never had somebody put me in that perspective before. But but public speaking, like I I can't. I've spoken uh, in a lot of different places. Nothing like that big. But mm -hmm. what's great about it is, you can have confidence going onto the stage and and, and speaking. Mm -hmm. But you're only as good as how well your audience is accepting and receiving what you're saying, right? I agree. So there's so much more, there's so much more propensity to, to feel like you're failing in that scenario yes. because you can't see the instant feedback unless people, it's awesome when you actually see a crowd laugh or they're smiling or they're nodding or they're taking notes, but yeah. that doesn't always happen. You're just sitting there you're thinking, right. man, is anybody listening? Is this falling on deaf ears right now? Whereas in a fight, it's like when I land a punch, I felt the punch land. I hear the crowd, you know, it's there's, and I'm so much more in control of what's happening in the fight. Right. Compared to speaking on a stage and just hoping that people are listening to what I'm saying. You yeah. know, <laughs> I always say you just got to get the first, you got to get the first minute of your speech down, you know, so you can get through the jitters. Um, yep. And you got to have a really good grasp of your topic because if your mind goes blank, you're just going off of what you really truly know. Everybody's and, biggest fear. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's why I never do. I never have um, notes and I don't really go off a of slide presentations. I just try to speak from the heart. That's awesome. But, um, Dude, you're amazing, man. I mean, this is this has been an un, un, unbelievable podcast. I mean, I'm gonna come back. We're gonna run it again after Oliveira. You're gonna walk through Oliveira. Heck Let yeah. me not walk Let's through go. him, but you're gonna you're, you're gonna finish. Him. I'd like to walk through him. That'd be um, great. I need it. I'm due for an easy fight. That'd okay. Be awesome. Well, you're gonna walk, walk through him. him. I'm gonna I'm gonna put that out to <laughs> yeah. the universe, brother. Oliveira, I'm sorry, brother. My um, wife would love if I walk. My wife, my wife um, would love if I walk. Just walk through. Oh, yeah. No, so no more cauliflower on the ears. She's like, there's enough. Yeah, exactly. And um. Uh, you know, I, I end every podcast the same way, and there's no right or wrong answer to this question, but um, I ask every guest, what, what does it mean to you to be an ultimate human? I believe being an ultimate human isn't, isn't exactly where you are today or what you're doing today, but having the confident expectancy that if I continue to do the right things and I try to get the most out of the gifts that I was given, we all have unique gifts. There's, there's a certain list of things that we need to do there's a certain there are certain um roads that we need to go down there's certain things that we need to do to optimize ourselves. Mm -hmm. um but ultimately becoming the best version of yourself and not just physically you know i'm obviously a guy who i'm always trying to be the best physical version of myself but it's there's nothing more important to me than when people say hey i i love who you are not because of your veins your abs or you look like a super superhero or any mm. of these things you fight in a cage, but because you're a good human being and you want to become the best version of yourself and you want to see other, other people become the best version of yourself because that version of yourself is out there. And sometimes you need to go through tough um, scenarios to get there, but he, he or she is out there. It just yeah. depends on whether or not you have the courage to go through um, the mud and the muck and the valleys and keep on climbing. Yeah. You know, I, I got to tell you, I mean, I, I wasn't planning on telling this story, but, but to your point, um, when you walked in here today, um, you know, my, uh, my private security, uh, guard is so also a very, very close friend of mine. He's a former professional, uh, MMA heavyweight. Um, I'm walking by and I overhear him pull you aside and tell you what a difference he you've yeah. made in his life as an athlete, he told you that you had the greatest influence over him to get kind of pull his shit together in his relationship with yeah. his, with his girlfriend and 
and and put her and his relationship first. And I just I overheard the conversation and and um, you know this is this is a um, someone that did seven combat tours, you know, um, former Marine, you know, MMA fighter, um, you know, big burly dude. And he, and you had touched his life in that way. And I don't yeah. think you guys have ever met. So your message is resonating brother. Yeah. It's, um, those, and I got to hear it today firsthand. Those, those are those moments, man. It's, and, he, and, the, and once again, just goes back to gratefulness and yeah. gratitude and th that I get to do what I get to do. And there's, there's, there's a, a calling on my life and, and for me to not give every single ounce of my human to it yeah. is, is really bastardizing those blessings. Well, I know everybody in this room and everybody on this podcast cannot wait to see the Olivera fight. <laughs> Can't wait, man. I'm getting pumped. I we'll leave, be for, there. leave for Florida tomorrow yeah. or Monday. And so, camp time. Camp time, baby. Awesome, brother. Well, best of luck, man. Yes, Michael sir. Chandler, I hope to have you back, man. Thank you for having me. That's just science. <laughs>